we drop the connection in between. Yes. So no. you were telling about uh, the things that already covered. So definitely sort of show some some personal projects, experience that you've already worked in a team. Um, just the fact that you want to about something makes a huge difference because it really shows through to you. So all of that is great. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, can we have the next question, Karen? Yeah. How do you think one can try stand out in this competitive environment around? It is it is a very competitive environment, isn't it, right now? Um, here's here's what I will tell you that, and you know, plus from a personal experience, I remember when I went from Bareilly to Delhi. So I went from this this all girls convent school in Bareilly to DPS Archipur in Delhi, and then from DPS Archipur to IIT Delhi, and then from IIT Delhi to Facebook. At each of those steps, um, I was like, oh my god, now I'm going to. Be so much better than me and it's going to be so competitive so i completely feel you but i also want to tell you that the competitive environment it's it's not something that like is a one-time thing if if you're doing things right you'll always be around people who are really ambitious and who are really driven and who want to get better so there'll always be a competitive environment around you and hopefully that's coming from a place where people do want to do better in terms of uh, how you stand out i think two things make a huge difference. You'd be surprised at how many people, and maybe this is a bit early because I know a lot of you are still in college, but you'd be surprised, and, and this becomes more important once you're in the workforce because currently when you're in college, it's it, there's a lot of structure to learn. You know, these are the courses I need to do. This is the like X, Y, Z steps I need to do to like attain my destination. Once you're in work and you're figuring life out, it's not as structured. So a lot of times you read about other people, you learn from other people's experiences, you introspect a lot, you try things, you see what works, what doesn't, to be like, oh, what is it that I wanna learn? And what is it that I wanna get better at? And as trivial as that sounds, there's very few people who do that. There's very few people who have a really sound understanding of what are my interests? What is, what is it I want to do? What is it? What are my strengths? What is it that I'm passionate about? And a lot of us find it much easier to just follow what others are doing, right? So I know in India we use this word called bhir child, but it's it's very common. Like, and it, it becomes even more common, you know, FOMO and bhir child. All of this becomes very a lot more common when things are not as structured because then you're like, I'm not sure what I'm doing, so I'm just going to copy what this other person is doing. Turns out they're not sure what they're doing either. So it is very important to have a good understanding of what are my pa my passions, my strengths, my interests. I'll be very honest, and I think that is what is going to make you stand out in this competitive environment. Because you will only really be really good at something if your heart is in it, if you're actually passionate in something. Like if you want to become an expert in a field, you can only really become an expert when you put in so much time. And you only be able to put in so much time if your heart is really in it. So you need to have a solid understanding of what is it my heart in it is in. Um, and I think that is what can make you stand out in the competitive environment. If you were looking for something that's a little less philosophical and more tangible in terms of what is it that you can do to stand out in your current competitive environment, personal projects. Why? Because they show exactly this passion. They show this is something I'm passionate about, and that's why I've taken the time and energy to invest, um, invest in it. So that passion, uh, like compared with the person projects, brings out the best in you in a way. Right, right. Uh, can we have the next question, please? Yeah. And uh, to the audience listening, we are very sorry for the inconvenience caused in between. There was some trouble with the stream. Yeah. How the next tier, so is the tier two or tier three college students again? What are tier two or tier three college students? How do you define tier two or tier three? So I believe what they mean to say is those who are not from the IITs and IITs in the bits oh. in the industry that are labeled as tier one. So yeah, in that context. As as I said, right, once you get past the screen, like your GPA, the college you come from, your field of study, none of that matters. And the screen really only looks at um, things like, oh, can you communicate properly? Oh, do you have basic algorithmic knowledge? Hey. Can you write code that makes sense? Can you use proper syntax? All of that. So um, I, I, I would say it's fairly, it is fairly easy. The only difference, obviously, I also want to be realistic, right? The difference is that in some of these colleges, 
So in some of the colleges, the companies are actively going and recruiting versus you yourself have to take a lot more initiative in some cases to be like, you know, I'm going to put myself out there. But I will be honest that I've, I'm seeing so many students in India right now use LinkedIn so well, wherein people are really like putting themselves out there by using LinkedIn, by being like, I'm going to go out and like apply for these scholarships. I'm going to go and apply for this summer of code or I'm going to go and compare a program or I'm going to like reach out to someone on LinkedIn to apply for an internship. So I, I am seeing a lot of students put themselves out there. So I think the main difference is that you do have to put in more effort in putting yourself out there. But once you do, it's a, once you do, it's a level thing. Once your resume is in the hands of a recruiter, it's a level thing. Let me put it that way. Fair enough. So they just have to put that extra effort to make uh, themselves seen in a way. Yes. Got it. Got it. Uh, can I have the next question? Uh, Dashada, it would be fine, right? We can take a few more questions for the next five minutes. Yeah. Overshot yeah. the time, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Karen, can we have the next question? What technology did you work on in your college days? Um, is this in terms of like, I actually did a lot of different things in my college days. So one of the things that I, I was just very excited about, I like knew the ins and outs of Java. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I like remember reading an entire book on Java and I, I found the language very fascinating um, back in the day at least. Um, I remember doing some projects in, in computer hardware. Um, I, did, I did quite a bit of reverse engineering, which I found a lot of fun. We, it's something we would do as a part of our computer science society puzzles. Um, I did some competitive programming. I did some stuff in operating systems and networking as well. I don't know if there was like a specific question. In terms of like so, so what's it taken away in terms of? Uh, because as you know, the, these tools and technologies become obsolete very quickly. If you see, so what is there? What, what specific tools and technologies are talking about, Pallavi? Like in terms of if we can start the programming languages or even say Android when it started and to what it is now. So what I might be learning in my first tour might might evolve uh, till the time I get into the market. So mm -hmm. what, what things to be kept in mind while even learning these technologies? While that's a great question. Yes, that's a great question, right? So here's the thing. If you know the ins and outs of a programming language, you might not remember those ins and outs five years later, but that, but Understanding that gives you so much more power to reason about the trade-offs between different programming languages the next time you're picking up a project. So just because I had this really thorough understanding of Java, I am now able to reason about is Objective-C better for something or is Java better? Or because I have spent a lot of time working on with PHP, I'm able to like reason about the pros and cons of different languages to be like, oh, like is strongly is strongly type better in some situations or is this better? So in so similar to like the example you used with Android, right? It gives you the understanding of what are some basic things you like in an operating system. So once you've worked on Android, you're like, oh, actually, I like developing on the iPhone better for the for X, Y, Z reasons. So these are the pros and cons of different operating systems, which makes you more knowledgeable. For, for, for instance, for Nick, for instance, if you end up joining the Apple team or the Android team, you know what like you can bring that expertise to be like, oh, these are these are the things we should be building, or this is how we should be improving the language, or this is how we should be improving the OS. Or if you were building the world's next like most used OS, then you can use all of those, all of that expertise and experience you already have about about the OS. Not necessarily about Android, but like OS in terms of the different pros and cons that you could then use there. Correct. So having that exposure kind of helps you even decide that what would be a better technology to use, you know, in different situations. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, so can we have the next question? Yeah. So, oh, how has the COVID have, situation affected oh. in general? Yeah, so um, I, I think you know different companies have responded to it differently. At Facebook in general, the it hasn't adversely affect, affected our recruiting in any way. So we are still recruiting the exact same way we used to. Obviously, we're not doing on sites anymore. So everything is over VC. But thankfully, we have a lot of really good tools to do to do interviewing over VC, and we have. Like we've done trainings for interviewers internally to make sure that people to that make sure it's a really good experience for the candidates as well. So at least it hasn't affected recruiting. At least for Facebook, it hasn't affected recruiting adversely in terms of in terms of how we hire in a normal year. Got it. Got it. So in a way, it's it's relatively stable there. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, Karen, can we have the next question? 
So in a way, but I would like to ask you, or in terms of recruitment, earlier uh, Facebook might want to have people always like in the office or might be hiring for different offices. So how has that trend changed, and uh, what's the openness to remote work that's happening? Before we move uh, to the next. So it's it's interesting because I literally two weeks ago I had a few interns start on my team and they're all starting remotely. I had a new hire start on my team five weeks ago where he's done his entire onboarding remotely, like from home. So as a company, you know, one of the things we are realizing is if we do want to have an international presence and continue working and continue hiring, we want to make sure that we have top-notch remote work um, systems as well, remote onboarding tools as well. So so far that's been quite good. Um, I think it's a fairly new space. It's one of those areas where we'll make mistakes, we learn, we'll improve. But it's been, it's been quite um, impressive to see the company's openness there. Good, good, fair enough. Oh, fair enough. Oh, so yeah, I, I get it. And in a way, I would say that um, having an international presence plus those restrictions opening up in terms of people coming to a specific city to work, I believe even that those things would change gradually, and openness would come in there. So the next question comes from Ayush. What points you considered while preparing your resume while in college and tips for preparing resume? Or being a recruiter, maybe you can say from that angle, what are things that you look in a resume so that it's prepared accordingly? So I definitely look for, I know I've said this so many times on this call, but side projects, I definitely, one of the first things I look for is personal projects. I look for things that you've done outside of your curriculum. Uh, what are things that you what are projects you worked on that were not a part of like the expectations at work um at expectations at at college or as a part of your course side projects personal projects for sure i look at places where you worked with um in teams if you've done internships in the past i definitely i definitely pay attention to um you know what is it you worked like what are the different companies you worked in in terms of like how what are the things you liked in the place like how do you compare? Like, because at the end of the day, I want to better understand what your motivations are. What are things? Why you got in engineering? What are things that tick you? What are things that keep you excited? So, people might ask you to talk more around some of the more technically interesting problems you've solved. How you compare your experiences at different companies. So, when you're preparing a your resume, call those things out. Definitely talk about if you worked on something in your as a side project in your spare time. Call that out. Call that out to be like, oh, I worked on this with a team of three in my free time. Or this was a side project that it also like, what happened to that thing like did it get, shipped? Did it get launched do you try to um do you try to put it aside i pay attention to people who've gone to hackathons who've, who've built things in hackathons um yeah all of that typically interesting technical problems you've solved and side projects are, are a few things that are always good to call out correct so uh, other than just having them in your resume that that thought and the intention would also matter at the same time and it should just not be for the sake of doing it i believe absolutely okay. perfect so uh keeping uh time in mind we have the last question now uh yeah all right how do you manage maintain work-life balance um that's a good question i I think the work-life balance stuff, you know, it goes um, it goes up and down. So I, I think at different points, it's not so much of a work-life balance. I think it's more of a work-life integration in the sense that I think at different points, I have different priorities. So there are times when my team is working really hard on a project that we want to get out, or like a product we want to get out in the next two months, in which case work is an absolute priority. There are not as many burning things in my personal life. So I know that I'm probably not like, I know I'm going to sacrifice some of my like personal time to do that. And but that's also something that I'm willingly signing up for, right? So that, that's the difference, right? I'm willingly signing up for that. In terms of um work-life balance, one of the things I think I'm better at it now, but one of the things when I was trying to get better at it back in London was I used to I used to like book things. So I would I was like, I'm living in a city like London, so I need to do more things outside. So I would like book things. So either I would go watch uh, I, I would either do an acting class or I would go watch a play or I would do something and I would buy tickets for that and I would pay money and I would put it on my calendar for like 5.30 or 6 o'clock. And I was like, well, at this point, I've already paid for it. So I have to leave work at a certain time to be able to make it. I think that helped me make, that helped me make sure that I was being healthy with making sure that I was, I was like working and I was focusing on my personal life. And this was because uh, I felt like I was better at work when I was much 
much more enriched and satisfied personally, right? So it's I think it feeds both things. So that was that typically works when I don't have burning priorities in either situation, in either my personal life or my work. Obviously, as with all things, if, there, if there's something that's really burning at work, then sometimes I might shift time to focus more there. Which also means that at times when I've gone through like a personal crisis or like someone in family is sick or like there's something on the personal life that needs attention, then like I've had conversations with my manager where I've been like, you know, I think I'm not, or I've taken time off or I've had conversations where I've been like, you know, I really think that I wouldn't be as productive over the next few months because there's like my, I mean, my, my mom was going through a lot of health issues. I was like, you know, I really, there's so much going on that I really don't think I'll be as productive at work. And I think that's the beauty of good managers, good leadership. That's the beauty of like understanding companies as well, which a lot of what we have in tech is um, that people understand that at the end of the day, we're all dealing with people and we have a lot of stuff in our lives that goes. So I know that at times when I'm, every time I know that I'm giving a lot to work, I also know that to like in situations when I've had to take a step back from work because of things that have needed attention, I also have the space to do that. But on a normal day, I try to make sure that I have a very clear routine. Especially with the COVID situation, I try to make sure that I, I wake up at the same time. I have like I have a very clear routine. I take meetings from uh, from like specific times to specific times. Then I like then I read a bit and I go work out. Then I do like my my sync, like my music practice and all of that. So I think having a very clear routine and putting blocks on your calendars makes a huge difference in, in having that work-life balance. And it's something I advocate with my team as well, where I'm like, I mean. If you want to leave, if you want to start working at five, that's fine. Just communicate that to people so people don't message you or ping you afterwards and just set those expectations. Because the good thing is people don't necessarily want, at least in a lot of companies, they don't necessarily want you just there as FaceTime. They they care about the, the impact you have or the work you produce, which is not necessarily about the number of hours you put in, but the quality of those hours, which is which is a good thing. Fair enough. It's kind of a conscious commitment to yourself. And when you can and manage that balance, you need to have that to maintain that work-life balance. And very well, you said that as managers also, we need to understand that and kind of like ensure that our team is doing these things. Absolutely. Yeah, it's on us. Like, you know, as, as leaders, as managers, we, a lot of times, we are subtle role models and that what we do, our teams emulate that. So it's important for us to make sure we follow those things ourselves and then remind people that it's, it's okay if you want to like, I think Cheryl does a great job at that, right? Where she was like, I leave work at five and I'm, that's fine. And that literally makes easy for everyone else in the company to be like, cool, I'm going to leave work early and that's fine too. <laughs> Correct. So setting even earlier, I feel that communication, clear communication and setting those expectations play a crucial role. Absolutely. Doing this. That was great. That was great. Uh, thank you so much. Like with that, we'll have to come to an end, keeping time in mind. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and sharing such wonderful insights. I'm sure that community must have learned quite a few things from your experience. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. And I, I, I mean, I've always said like I do want to. I want to be back in India soon. And it's always, it's just, it's, it's like so enriching for me and so heartwarming to be able to give back to the community in any way at all. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who has joined us for this session. Uh, please do fill the feedback form. It will be shared in the comments. Your valuable feedback will help us improve the further sessions. And uh, with that, a customary, if you could help us, Nishita, with uh, just saying to stay updated, like, share, and subscribe to Coach's channel, that will help us. <laughs> Yes, please like, share, and subscribe to Coach Steph on all the platforms Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely having you. Thank you, everyone who joined. Thank you. Bye. Bye.